Hello everyone, my name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown. Generally speaking, most of the comics that I cover on the show are very all ages, as most comic companies want their books to sell to as wide an audience as possible. But sometimes I come across a book that's definitely aimed at a much more adult audience, as is the case with this episode. When I break down typhoid, I will be discussing topics of self-harm, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, sex workers, and murder. Let's start the show. Issue 3 opens up with demonstrations of how Mary's alters are continuing their branches of this murder investigation. Typhoid sits in the lap of the guy who runs the books for one of the houses that the prostitutes use, getting her the name of the last person that Tulip slept with. The guy called Baby, whose last name is actually Toranova. Mary then goes to the police station, pretending to be a church girl who just wants to pray for all of these poor girls that are getting killed. The officer that she's interacting with says that all investigations are on hold right now because a cop was killed last night. He can't give her names or anything like that. Like, that's private right now. Her goody two-shoes act earns her the officer's name, though, the one who was murdered last night. And that was Officer Reset, called Race. The man that we saw bloody kill at the end of the last issue. This was also the same man that we saw back at the start of issue one. He was the first person we saw tell a prostitute to suck his gun. Bloody does her own work, threatening a snitch for more information on Detective Richards. He says that he heard Richards drunk bragging about the West Side Ripper killing again. The snitch feels like Richard killed the girl himself, and that he was going to let the Ripper take the blame for the act. We then see Walker putting all of this together. If Race was killed yesterday, and the other girls are still investigating the murder, then he couldn't have been the real killer. Maybe Richards killed some of the victims, but he couldn't have killed them all. This Toranova guy, Baby, is her best lead. He was the last client with Tulip before she went missing, but that still means finding him. Walker holds up Detective Dodge's card. Maybe she would be game for a setup. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown episode 27.2 of Typhoid. Why do killers kill? At the 9th Precinct, we find Dodge in the police psychologist's office. He reports that the serial killer has an odd pattern at the moment. Serial implies a pattern of behavior, and this killer does not seem to really have one other than murdering young women. The knife is the preferred weapon for sexual criminals, as it enters the body repeatedly like a penis. The use of a gun indicates a similar anger due to its phallic nature, but this method hints at an additional oral fixation as the killer puts it in the women's mouths. But the caliber of bullet used in the killing keeps changing. Either their killer has an oral fixation and multiple guns, or they have more than one killer. Detective Dodge thanks the doctor for his analysis, and she goes to find Richards. Hilariously, his face is still marked up from the wire that Typhoid wrapped around it last issue. Dodge even gives him some good-natured crap about it. Oh, you fell, you say? Into what, a grill face detective? It's personal, he growls. Dodge smiles. Hmm, a little arrest and bondage maneuver then? Honestly, it's just great to see her turning the teasing tables on him. After all the crap that he gave Dodge in issue two, it's a fun reverse in their relationship. They then start to square off. Dodge is adamant about wanting to solve the murder of these prostitutes. Richards couldn't care less, and he mocks the victims relentlessly. He would rather investigate the murder of one of their own. You know, somebody who's actually important, like Officer Reset. They're interrupted when another officer tells Dodge that a woman is asking for her, and Walker greets her. She sells Dodge on the story of her having been hired as a private investigator. Walker currently has a theory, and she's got a girl uh, who is willing to be used as a decoy to test that theory out, but that's where Dodge stops her. No, 
she says. That is too dangerous, and the department will never agree for her to be responsible for that. She cannot use a civilian outlaw, which is what a prostitute is, in an active police investigation. Okay, played by the book, Walker says. She gives Dodge her own card in case she ever changes her mind. But Walker's going to keep working on this before woman number six dies. Dodge has bad news. Woman number six already did. It was a woman named Tulip. Walker punches the wall. No! I should have... God, I wish I'd... I'm going to kill that... She does calm down, eventually. Dodge says that, boy, you've got one hell of a temper. There's a real warrior in there somewhere. <laughs> if only you knew, Dodge. Walker explains that she knew Tulip, so the loss hits home for her. There was one client that Dodge could look into, and Walker gives her the name. It's a guy that they all call Baby. Dodge is amazed that Walker has this information. You got those women to talk to you? How? Because Walker isn't connected to her partner, Richards. The girls have to pay him, or he'll take away their kids, arrest their boyfriends, brothers. Any man that they're seen with is at risk of being arrested under the pretense of them being their pimp. And Richards even knows that they don't use a pimp, so it is complete bullshit that he just uses to lord his power over them. He does it so that he can get his bonuses. Dodge does not like hearing this, but she can't argue with it either. She agrees to look into Baby, but Walker suggests that she try investigating some cops instead of some street thugs. Word on the street is that the killer is a cop with an oral fixation. And then she leaves. When Walker gets back to her hotel, Trent is waiting for her. He pretends that they went to the same hospital together and that he has been looking for her. They're connected, he says. They're doppelgangers. They both know about the needles, the drugs, the solitary rooms, the shrinks, the whole deal, lady. Walker is adamant that she has never been to a hospital in her life, but when he doesn't shut up and he's beginning to cause a scene, she invites him back to her room. Once inside, Walker adds a note to the wall. Dead chick number six, Tulip. Then she shifts to typhoid, and Trent actually picks up on the shift. Something on that wall disturbed her. She shifted in order to deal with it. Trent gets that. He pulls up his sleeve, revealing his scars. He knows how to use physical pain to block the mental pain. Typhoid finds his cutting juvenile, calling the marks on his arm a road map. But then the two start to exchange phrases like, whatever sparks your flint, whatever floats your boat, toot your horn, toast your buns. It goes on for quite some time, like an alarmingly long amount of time, given that this is a 20, this actually isn't a 22 page comic. These issues have all been about 30 pages, but it's roughly a 30 page comic. It's Flavia, the woman who first called Gladys to let her know that her daughter had been murdered. She says that Hester has an appointment with Baby. Can Typhoid get there really quickly? Walker takes down the address, shoves Trent out of her room, and then takes off. She even hops into a phone booth and, like Superman, changes into her superhero persona, Typhoid, which I absolutely love. Typhoid is perhaps the least Superman-esque hero that I may have read from Marvel or DC in my life. Uh, but I mean, she is helping people. She's going to try to save another woman's life. So uh, between her general demeanor and costume, Typhoid does not bring to mind Superman, but that doesn't mean she can't do good things. Uh, I just love the absolute clash of contexts here. Typhoid goes into the room next to Hester's, thinking about the fact that she had already set up a signal with the rest of the girls. If they are in danger, they are at a pound on the wall that the rooms share. She'll then rush into the other room, save the girl, and hopefully catch whoever the Ripper is. But right now, she doesn't hear anything. Eventually, Hester's enters the room, assuring Typhoid that she's fine. Baby got babied, and he already left. She does have another client lined up, who she refers to as Mr. Clean. He looks like the white sheik, she says, implying that the guy is wrapped in all white. The doorman said that Typhoid had a client, too, which confuses her. She isn't working right now. No one even knows that she's here. 
we see Mr. Clean go into Hester's room, while Trent goes into Typhoid's. He asks if he can buy a kiss, and displays a bill. Ah, what the hell, she figures. Why not? He leans in close, and pricks her with a needle. She starts to black out, and Hester starts hitting the shared wall. She's in trouble. She needs her. Detective Dodge, meanwhile, breaks into Walker's room. She sees the walls of clues that the altars have gathered, the mass of mixed clothing. Walker is either a brilliant detective, or there gotta be multiple women staying here. Or maybe there are multiple women staying in Walker, huh? For the first time, she thinks that maybe Richards does have a point. The department has been stonewalling her on this case. Nobody wants to help her. Maybe it is time that she go a little rogue. We then get a short fantasy sequence in which Bloody murders Trent while continuing their exchange of phrases. Uh, this covers the gap of time between Typhoid being knocked unconscious and her transportation to this scene, where she is strapped to Quincy's medical chair. He and Trent give her the lowdown on what they want from her, which is her, but as a movie star, baby. And not just a movie star. This movie is going to be an experiment that is going to help the world understand killers, Quincy said. Why did she do it? Was she born that way? Was it childhood drama? Too many violent movies? Why, Mary, why? She mutters something unintelligible. Trent leans in. What was that? Physical pain blocks mental pain, right? Typhoid lunges forward and bites his ear. He howls in pain, and Quincy doses her again. Every time she pulls a crap stunt like that, she's going to lose another day to the dead zone, he says. As her consciousness fades, Typhoid mutters, So friggin' what? Detective Dodge, in the meantime, has gotten a hacker to look into the department's files on the West Side Ripper. And it certainly does look like a cover-up. Some of these cops involved are gross, like Jack Terranova? Jesus. But as a ripperologist, Clem the Hacker was more than happy to help and expand his collection. Dodge then confers with a man named Harry, who appears to be her mentor figure. He admits that he doesn't like the cover-up either, but cops need to honor the code of silence. It's them against the world in a war against lawlessness. They can't be fighting each other too, Dodge. Covering up the crimes of cops is a necessary evil sometimes in order to support a good system, he argues. But Dodge isn't buying it. Six women are dead in the name of good police work? Every time Terra Nova buys a girl, she ends up dead, Harry. That's not good. Look, Terranova did good work when he was a cop. He made a lot of big busts, got into some bad habits, retired rich. It's over with. And what habits allowed him to get that much money, Dodge asks. The department just looked the other way. They figured that through to all of his hard work, Terranova had earned it. Look, they put Dodge on this case because they didn't think that she was a good enough detective to actually find anything. They didn't expect her to solve it. And they teamed her with Richard so that he would squash it if she did solve the case. She may have figured all of this out, but she will never see it through as a cop. Okay, that's a pretty solid third issue. Everything in the plot moves forward pretty well. We've got this Terra Nova as a main suspect. We know that he's a former cop and that other cops are covering for him. That's all great. Plus, Mary and all of her personalities are in a tight spot now, at the mercy of Quincy and Trent. Strangely, Terra Nova's name does change throughout the miniseries. When he was first mentioned, the name was spelt Tora Nova, with an O, but here in issue 3, it does switch to and stay Terra Nova for the rest of the series, so that is what I will refer to the character as. I really liked Nocenti showing us the different ways that the altars were investigating. That was a fascinating bit of storytelling. It's really easy to just look at Typhoid or Walker as the main driving forces of not just the story, but the conglomeration that is Mary Walker. 
Those two alters feel the most capable. They're both cautious yet angry, and Typhoid is the one character who really makes use of their mutant powers the most. And like I mentioned last episode, the bloody altar really feels like the uh, final resort option. Like, she only gets brought out when someone is going to die. But it's hard to think of when a nice, pleasant, more girly personality like Mary would be useful. So seeing it actually demonstrated in the story was a really good idea to me. I'm not really sure what the scene between Typhoid and Trent was, though. Trent does come off as kind of creepy, because he's honestly being kind of creepy, but Walker is sure that she can handle him, or at least she's sure that one version of her can handle him. So I get that part of it. I understand why she just invites him up to her room just to get him to shut up, and then if she needs to kill him, bloody can kill him. But when Trent and Typhoid start whatever sinks your ship ing, I just don't really know what that's supposed to be. I'm assuming that it is meant to indicate that they're like on the same mental wavelength. Like, for all of their many differences, this is one thing that they have in common. Typhoid says the first one, Trent replies with a similar phrase, and then Typhoid chuckles. She actively goes like. <laughs> And Trent seems to pick up on the fact that she thinks this phrasing is funny, and then he just keeps riffing with her, indicating those good people skills that we were not only told that he had, but we were shown that he had. So I'm assuming that this scene was meant to indicate a minor bond between Trent and Typhoid slash the Walker personalities. This is why she's willing to let him get close to her, because he seems harmless and there's a connection there that didn't exist otherwise. Then we get to the stakeout, with Hester used as bait. She survives her time with Baby, which we now know is also Terra Nova, a former police officer who's got dirty money. That's how we can afford all these prostitutes. But then we get a new wrinkle in the form of Mr. Clean. There's only a single panel shown of this guy, and like Hester says, he is wrapped up tight. He's got sunglasses on, a hat, a headscarf, a big white coat. Whoever this character is, Nocenti and Van Fleet want to keep us guessing. This could easily be Baby come back in disguise. Why he would, I don't know, but it could be. I'm just saying. Uh, it's unlikely that it would be Quincy, because why would he go into the city if Trent is going into the city? Why, why wouldn't they go together? Why wouldn't he help him see through the mission of getting married? I wouldn't understand. So I don't think it's Quincy or Trent. It could be Richards, and maybe the whole reason he's doing all that work to disguise his face is because he doesn't want to get caught killing another prostitute. It's a lot of good options. It makes a lot of story sense why the character is being presented in the way they're being presented. Uh, and I just like it. It's just smart. Uh, and intriguing. Mr. Clean and Hester then, you know, get down to business, and it starts to go wrong, and Typhoid can't do anything about it. Her brief meeting with Trent lulled her into a false sense of security, which, like I said, I think is the real purpose of that scene, and now she is very much in danger, both Typhoid and Hester. The thing I love most about the scene with Typhoid uh, strapped down is her absolute lack of fear at losing days to the drugged state threat. Because the altars all have to share a single body, right? They already lose time each time a new one of them takes over. So what does she care? Plus, she already failed to save Hester, so it's not like she's exactly in a hurry to escape. The person that she was trying to save is already dead. The final scene between Detective Dodge and Harry perfectly sums up Dodge's dilemma. She's got a pretty good idea of who the Ripper is now, but exposing him will mean going against the entire body of the police brotherhood and potentially breaking the same rules that this criminal breaks. Her whole first scene with Richards was meant to establish that Dodge does things by the book, because that's morally the right way to do things, dang it. Richards plays outside the book, because from his perspective, that's the only way you're going to get any good police work done in the real world. He believes in doing good enforcing the rules by breaking the rules a little bit to benefit yourself. Dodge believes in enforcing the rules will make the world better for everybody, and she's seeing that now, that is not always the case. Dodge has to choose. Does she play by the rules and let a killer go on killing? Or does she break the rules 
and save some lives. The only real problem I have with this scene is the sudden addition of the Harry character. I referred to him as Donja's mentor because he talks as if he trained her. He's clearly some kind of senior to her. He definitely knows more about his precinct's history than she does, but uh, we are given no information on who this guy is or why he is important to the detective other than my guesswork. There are actually a couple times in the overall story where Nocenti just kind of glosses over a detail like this, where a character will appear or do a thing, and we won't get an explanation as to why. It never ruins the story or anything, but it can be extremely jarring. If I was reading this comic on a monthly basis, uh, like when it had first been released, I probably would have gone back and then looked for Harry in the previous two issues because he comes out of nowhere and I'd be going, who is this guy? What's his relationship? Reread the last issue. But then I would have found him nowhere and I would have been even more frustrated and confused. However, you might recall in the first issue that the second prostitute killed was a woman named Rachel and Walker and Flavia both entered Rachel's room, thanks to Detective Dodge, and the police found a black book that had a list of Rachel's clients. The last one was a police officer, and we then cut to a scene of the police going, hey man, don't worry, this isn't going to be a thing, the girl died, but we're going to keep your name out of it, like, just have a nice day, and then bloody killed that police officer. At the time, that scene may have felt a little bit out of place, and a little bit extreme, given that bloody went to outright killing this guy. He even says he didn't kill Rachel. She was alive when he left the room. The, see, the point of that scene was to set up this idea that the police are covering for each other's bad behavior. So when we get to this part of the story where Dodge has to go, can I trust the very office that I work with? Can I trust my co-workers or am I screwed here? We see evidence of the actual situation where Dodge is going to have to work outside of the law, and then we're put in a situation where she finds another situation like it, and she doesn't know what to do. And that's a really cool dilemma for this character to be put in, uh, especially given that Dodge is really kind of a secondary character. After all, Typhoid is our lead character for this, right? Uh, I do love the amount of attention that Dodge's character is getting. She feels fleshed out and real, despite the fact, like I said, that she is a secondary character. That's some good comics right there. Issue 4 opens with Mary strapped to the medical chair. A large, wired electrical device has been placed on her head, and her eyelids have been held open. Quincy explains that his plan, his movie, is going to be about curing her. They're going to show her a constant stream of violent images, movies, and clips until she is sick of it. This kind of thing has worked on sex offenders, he says, where they showed sex offenders pornography until it just bored them. They've also done the same thing for fat people, you know, made them eat cake until they're sick of it, and then they'll associate feeling sick with eating the cake, and from then on, they couldn't. He's going to document the process of doing that to Mary. He's going to cure her, and he's going to make a movie all at the same time. A real film verite, he calls it, and he calls it it relentlessly. He... Every time Quincy shows up, he mentions his film Verite, and quite frankly, even after only three issues of it, I'm sick of it. Quincy and Trent then start to play with the device that is attached to Mary's head, which seems able to trigger her memories. I don't know how, I don't know why, we don't get an explanation for it, they just can do this. They ask about Mary's past. When did she start killing people? Why? What happened to her? Mary does think about it, and we see a response inside her mind, where she breaks free and snaps Quincy's neck. But she also goes on to herself, asking why shouldn't she kill? She loves to kill him in her fantasy, saying that the spark of his death thrills her. Quote, When the light goes out in their eyes, a kick goes down her spine. Death smells like birth to me. And once you're marked, you're marked the stigmata of first blood. Every time I see someone die, I know they are dying, but it feels like I'm the one dying. How can I explain these things to children? End quote. They will never understand why Mary kills unless they go through the hell that she did to become who she is. 
In reality, though, Typhoid does nothing. She just stares at Quincy. Trent suddenly exclaims the whoa because her vitals shift. Her heart rate, her pulse, even her EEG, her very brain patterns, it all changes into that of another person. That isn't possible, Quincy argues, but it happened. This is Mary shifting between alters from one persona to another. I can't honestly tell you if it's Mary switching to typhoid or typhoid switching to bloody. We aren't really given any more context for it, but it's meant to indicate that the changes that Mary goes through are so complete between her alters that it changes her actual personhood. She's almost literally a different person just in one body. At the ninth precinct, Detective Dodge confronts Detective Richards. She wants the name of the officers that are involved in this cover-up, but Richards refuses her. They don't need any more bad press making people hate cops, Dodge. There are seven dead women that could have been warned that some sick guy was... was... She tries to argue with him, but Richards just cuts her off. Hey, why a guy? It could be a woman, which Dodge doesn't believe. A woman would never do this kind of sick crap, she argues. Plus, there is still the connection to Jack Terranova to investigate. Richards dismisses those concerns, too. Look, Terranova's a family man now. Wife and kids. Rich. A good record. He denies any knowledge of the killings, and the cops believe him. Let it lie, Dodge. Never, she says. I'll form an independent investigation committee. I'll go to the press. Oh, yeah? Richards smugly informs her that the chief is putting in for a transfer for her to a nice Mexican border town. He thought that she would like it, suggested it himself. Dodge glares at him. I'll turn in my badge first. Still sucking on his lollipop, Richard smiles. Yeah, I thought so. Back at Quincy's place, we return to the inside of Mary Walker's mind. We see a little dark-haired girl, Mary, and we know it's Mary because Van Fleet has her wear a checkered dress with the letters for Mary scattered across the chest of it. Behind Mary is a shadowed building interior, the words Once Upon a Dream scrawled all over the walls. A woman sits inside a chair, maybe wearing a straight jacket. It's hard to make out, thanks to Van Fleet's artwork. She is telling Mary the truth of fairy tales, that Prince Charming is an oily con man. Cinderella just got cinders. Once upon a time, all you do is get old. Quincy and Trent tweak the machine in the real world, and we go back further in Mary's mind. We see an even younger Mary with a six-shooter inside of her mouth. It's tied in place, just like Mary did to Detective Richards in issue two. Whoever did this to her tells her that if she breathes or trips, it'll pull the trigger and she'll blow her bad head off. We see Mary think that this was called explosive reenactment by the doctor. Quote, gross, brutal injustice is visited upon a small, helpless child. The child grows up, and no amount of vengeance can purge that violation. End quote. Every person that Mary kills is the same person, that bastard, over and over again. She's doing it for every little girl who can't kill her secret bastard. We then cut to Dodge, who is at another location inside of Terra Nova Mansion. We are told for a fact that this is another location, meaning the previous location we were just in is inside Terra Nova Mansion. Quincy is Quincy Terra Nova, the son of Jack Terra Nova, who is baby, who has been hiring prostitutes who then end up getting murdered. Dodge is talking to Jack, asking him to contact her if he ever changes his mind about talking to her. He thinks that will be unlikely, given that he heard she's off the force. Is that right? It is. Dodge turned in her badge this morning. But confessing is still the right thing to do. She implores him to call her, and then she leaves, slamming the door. From behind him, Jack's wife approaches. What a nice woman. She wonders what all those questions were about. 
Jack spins around on her. You know what it was about, Queen of Denial. Your little trips into the city, following me. Well, it's over. He protected her this time, but that means that it's over for the both of them. And when we see Mrs. Terranova, she is dressed from head to toe in white. So, just for summation's sake, Quincy is the son of Jack Terranova and his wife. Jack is actually Baby, a former crooked cop who hires prostitutes in the city. His wife, Mr. Clean, then kills those prostitutes out of, what, jealousy? Wow. What a tangled web Anne Nocenti has weaved. Ah, and I love how it all comes together at the same time. All the clues are there, all the little bits that are planted works really well. And I'll fully admit, I'm bad at solving mysteries. Absolutely the worst at it. You give me a detective movie, I will never solve the crime. That's just not how my brain is put together. I can follow story beats really well. I cannot follow murder clues, and I don't know why. Upon my second or third time reading this miniseries, uh, I actually finally put together that when we see Jack in the first issue, looking at the undeveloped film going, I'm innocent, the proof is here, I know it, I know it. We now know that whoever this guy is, he's looking for proof that he's innocent. When we see Baby for the first time in the streets, when Typhoid is hanging out with the prostitutes in issue two, that character looks exactly like the same guy in issue one. To be fair, the first time we see Baby, he does have the leather mask on, so you don't put two and two together, unless you're paying attention to that background detail. And then you're paying attention to the guy who was in the opening scene. And then the next time we see him in issue three, when he goes to visit Quincy, we could have put together one and two and three, but we didn't. I would also like to point out that in the first issue, we did see a scene where a mother character was washing dirty money. And then a little kid went to reach out to some of it. That was Mrs. Terranova cleaning Jack's dirty money back when he was a cop. Now that we're in the modern day, and the mess that Jack is making is with other women, she's cleaning things up by eliminating the other women. The name, Mr. Clean, is a clue to this, as is her all-white clothing when she goes to take care of Hester. All the clues are there. I just never was able to point them, put them together. That's... <laughs> That's great. I also love this reveal because the last time that we saw Dodge and Richards, he suggested that a woman could have been responsible for these murders and Dodge wouldn't even consider it. We all have our own biases and in her eagerness to help the women who are victims of these murders, Dodge has overlooked the possibility that it could be a woman committing them. Although, in Dodge's defense, there has been nothing in this story to indicate Mrs. Terranova or another woman as a suspect up to this point. Back at Quincy's film set, down in the basement, Trent has removed the device from Mary's head and stopped the procedure. They're killing her, he says. He will not keep doing this to her. Remember, Trent insisted that Mary be treated respectfully back in issue one, and I'm not quite sure how he jives that with uh, drugging her and kidnapping her and bringing her to this basement against her will. But he does. Like we said, all people are complicated people. And uh, he's clearly reached his breaking point, finally. Quincy, however, doesn't want to stop yet. They need an ending to the movie, Trent. He turns to Mary. Tell me what you remember. Look into the camera and don't try anything funny. Mary looks at him. She saw her childhood, things she never knew before. She says that she feels calm now, purged. Quincy holds up his gun, which he's been waving around quite casually in his scenes. See, Trent? It worked! We've cured her, man! Mary, now realizing that he bought her act, keeps it up. She thanks Quincy for helping her. She'll never hurt anyone ever again. So, which personality is this, he asks. He wants to talk to Typhoid. Tell him about the act of killing. How did it feel the first time that she did it? Trent cuts in again, protesting any further questions. Dude, she's had enough. It's time to let her go. 
But this is great, Quincy says. The backstory, the thematic fabric of it all. This confessional scene, you know, they can splice it together with the earlier footage of her pain. As his directorial thoughts keep running his mouth, Trent checks in on Mary. Are you okay? She suddenly seems to go into a, a panic state, crying out that she doesn't want to remember. Sure, she killed and killed and killed, and when she couldn't stop, she just killed some more. We then jump inside of her mind, where we see both adult Mary and young Mary. Adult Mary tells young Mary that it's time to grow up. They need to take the splinter out now. But young Mary says she wants it to stay in. Adult Mary then doubles over, and we see a knife shoved inside of her stomach. The white dress that she wears is stained with blood, and she drops to the floor. Suddenly, Typhoid pulls her head back by the hair. Little virgin Mary, that crap doesn't fool me. She goes around like a dumb bunny, batting her lashes with all this innocent bullshit. It's just a scam. She manipulates people with this demure act more than any of the rest of them, Typhoid says. Mary stands up, hurt and confused. She orders Typhoid not to say such terrible things. But Typhoid doesn't care. She might be a vixen, sure, but at least she's honest about it. Which is crazier, Typhoid's honest behavior or Mary's complex lies? Mary says that she would never hurt anyone. As she stabs the knife into Typhoid now. She would never hurt Typhoid. They're like sisters after all. As she pulls the knife out, though, blood shoots from the wound, and Mary's eyes seem to glaze over. Oh, look. Pretty red paint. From behind, Bloody grabs the katana off of Typhoid's back. Do you think your sexy waves give you power? You exploit yourself. You demean yourself. You're as much a pathetic doll as the others. They aren't at war. They need to be warriors. They broke us, the bastards, and they need to die over and over again. Bloody wins the struggle for the katana, and she runs Typhoid through with it. Typhoid then turns into Walker. You're just a killer, she accuses. You kill men who hurt women, and you call yourself a super feminist because of it, but it's all garbage. You're just a killer too, like those men. If you really believed that murderers need to die, then you would just kill yourself. But you can't kill women because they're all innocent. They're all poor, innocent victims, aren't they? Bloody sneers. You're the one who's got them all fooled with your logic and your rational talk. That's the real joke. Sanity is the most sophisticated form of insanity around. Walker grabs at the white cloth that Bloody is wrapped in, and she pulls at it. It looks like she pulls it over her head like a shawl, and she transforms again. Mary looks at the space where Bloody used to be. Whatever. Back in the real world, we find Mary balled up on the floor. Dialogue between Trent and Quincy indicates that her telekinesis went wild while she was suffering that episode, breaking her free and destroying their set. Quincy actually double curses because his gun has ended up next to her. Is, is she going to kill us? He asks his friend. After what they did, wouldn't you? Trent replies. Mary does indeed pick up the gun. Guns are lighter without bullets, she says. Humans are lighter without brains. Here's to lightening the load. And she sticks the gun in her mouth. But just before she can pull the trigger, Trent's hand grabs the slide, preventing it from firing. Quincy moans, Oh, dude, you ruined the movie! That would have been the perfect ending! Mary buries her face in her arms, all of her emotions releasing. Why am I here? Where am I? Trent does actually seem to be concerned for her. You don't remember? Well, a movie star did once say that a bad memory was the key to happiness. Quincy tries to deliver a shot to Mary's arm to calm her down, but she grabs him just in time to stop him, shouting at him. He protests, saying that he cured her, he helped her. 
Mary disagrees. It was all lies. You want to know why killers kill? Did it ever occur to you that some people just should be dead? She stands up, looking around the area. Which way out of this dungeon? As she moves through the house, Typhoid runs into Jack Terranova, and she recognizes him as Baby. He's the one who got all those girls killed. No, he says, that is not true. He didn't kill them. He knew that someone was killing the women after he had been with them, so he snuck back one time with one of his son's cameras. He actually filmed the murder. Remember back at the start of issue one? There was a man looking over underdeveloped film saying that now he has his proof. That was Jack Terranova, having filmed his wife killing the prostitute, Cynthia, that he had just slept with. Typhoid can't believe it. You just watched that girl die? You didn't even try to save the life of the girl who just slept with you? Jack might not have much decency left, but he does at least look shamed. Which is when Mrs. Terranova joins the scene. And Typhoid recognizes her. She was... She was the last trick that Hester saw. She is the one who killed Hester. A woman is the killer? Typhoid breaks for a moment. She can't do anything to her. She can't kill a woman. Not that it, not that it matters. None of this is real, Typhoid says. You're a new one. You're just another voice in my head, and I can ignore you by the thousands. Mrs. T cocks an eyebrow. You don't think I'm real? How insulting. These women that you champion, did you know that they ruin lives and destroy marriages? They tempt men, they exploit themselves, and they ruin the lives of others. How can you sell yourself, she asks. How can you buy someone else? And how many of these filthy women did she kill, Typhoid asks. Mrs. T read about the first murder in the newspaper. This is the prostitute that Officer Race killed, Cynthia. Then she just, you know, added to the count. A blonde, a redhead, an Asian girl, and a black girl. How was she supposed to compete with all of that? Okay, Typhoid says. So, Race, the cop that Bloody killed, he did the first one. And then uh, Mrs. T killed four more. That still leaves two unaccounted for. Richards must have done one of them, maybe two of them? While she's piecing all of this together, Jack calls Detective Dodge, or former Detective Dodge, I suppose I could say, and asks her to warn Detective Richards. That night, Bloody uses her telepathy to listen to the voices of the city. She's listening for one specific voice, and she follows it along its route, collecting favors and prizes as it goes. From a rooftop, Bloody watches Richards try to shake down another contact. When he's done, she drops down next to him. Hi, Dick. Why did you kill those women? He adjusts his tie casually, either not afraid or too stupid to know that he should be. <laughs> you again? Look, no one cares if a whore dies. Bloody punches him. For Cynthia, she shouts, and she keeps on punching him. For all the women murdered. For every little girl who gets raped in the dark. For every bruise. Dodge interrupts. Richards begs her through bloodied teeth to help him to shoot this crazy bitch. She holds open her coat where her pistol would have been. Dodge can't shoot her. She doesn't have a gun anymore, remember? He forced her to resign. Bloody reaches into Detective Richards' coat and grabs his gun. Why are you doing this? He asks through bloodied lips. Bloody shoots him three times through his stomach. I don't like men who suck lollipops, she answers. Bloody then looks at Dodge and offers her a souvenir. Dick's blood-covered gun. The women smile at each other. In an epilogue, we see that Walker has an official office as a private investigator. We find Mary writing a new postcard to John when there's a knock at the door. A woman comes in and says that she wants someone sent to jail. She pulls off her glasses, revealing beaten, bruised eyes. Detective Walker is out at the moment. 
but Mary assures her that she can and is able to help her. That was a fast ending. Too fast, in my opinion, for it to honestly be satisfying. So let's take a step back and look at some things. First off, we appear to have some clues as to Mary Walker's disturbing past. Now, I would like to say from what my research shows that there has been no definitive version of Typhoid Mary's origin story. It has been tweaked, updated, changed, and hinted at several times throughout the course of her existence, and unfortunately, Mary's DID makes her own memories a fairly unreliable source of information. Plus, you have the added fact that if whatever did happen to her happened when she was a little girl, there's decades of experience, and admittedly, probably not a lot of decades, like two decades, I guess, but she does have years of experience that have clouded those memories, changed them, tinted them. The human mind automatically edits and changes our memories anyways. So what she remembers might not be what happened, but it's what she feels is what happened. So how much of what we saw here in this comic was a real thing that happened to Mary and how much of it was blocked out or made up or was simply confused is impossible for us to tell. It seems to me like Mary's mother, or a mother-like figure, told her twisted versions of classic fairy tales. But where the girls get saved in Snow White or Sleeping Beauty or Alice in Wonderland, Mary is told that no one is coming. The men in those stories just want to use the girls or hurt them. The only thing that you get from being a good girl, Mary was told, was old, and then you die. Mary appears to have had a gun tied to her mouth at some point, but she says that the doctor called this explosive reenactment. This makes it sound like it happened to her once before and caused some amount of trauma, and then, after she was checked into a mental institute, the doctor repeated the act! Why we aren't told, I would assume because he thought that it would help her get over those feelings, but that is a pretty messed up thing to do anyways. Even a doctor, someone who was supposed to help Mary, forced her to relive potentially the most traumatic experience of her life. No one is coming to help her. No Prince Charming, no White Knight, no doctor, no police officer. Just an endless string of men come to hurt her. This is why Mary Walker developed DID, to protect herself. Typhoid took that sexual trauma and she weaponized it, using her seductiveness and body in order to draw men in close for the kill. Bloody looks at other women and only sees victims, because that's what she was, and so she cannot hurt another woman. The DID was to protect Mary, because no one else in her life would. We then see Mary arguing with herself in her own head. Adult Mary tells young Mary to pull out the splinter, which is represented as a knife, which young Mary stabs into adult Mary. Given that the psychiatrist told us in issue three that knives are considered stand-ins for insertion in sexual crimes, it's a fair guess to say that young Mary was possibly raped at some point. The splinter that adult Mary refers to was that man's penis, and young Mary was never able to get over the act so it got passed on to her older self, to adult Mary. Note that even Typhoid uses a katana as a weapon, which is a weapon generally made for slashing. Whoosh. But it's notable here that Bloody runs Typhoid through with it, stabbing her like it's a knife. And Typhoid then accuses Bloody of being as bad as the men who hurt them. Young Mary took whatever trauma she had in her past, and she is fixated on a phallic weapon that she now uses against men in the very same way that men use their phalluses against her. And from a traumatic character background standpoint, that's terrible. It's heartbreaking. Uh, it's legitimately disturbing, even in the realm of fiction to read this and exper even experiencing it to the minor amount that I'm theorizing. Uh, it's just sobering 
heartbreaking that this kind of stuff does happen. Maybe not this exact situation, but that women are raped. Little girls are raped. Men and boys are raped. It's terrible. <sighs> this internal conflict culminates in a telekinetic storm that frees Mary's body from Quincy's chair. And I think that this conflict that we just saw is the same basic conflict that we witnessed back in issue one when we saw Mary in that security footage talking to herself. I think that scene was an echo of this one. It was like a setup for it. Mary's various personalities are capable of working together when focused on something. But otherwise, they bicker and fight. They pick at each other. Trapped in that cell, they were just cycling through control of the body. And here, with her mind poked and prodded by Quincy's machines, she couldn't control them anymore. The internal conflict got to such a pitch that her telekinesis went wild and ultimately did free her. <sighs> that is some incredibly heavy storytelling, and I will fully admit that it's a lot of reading between the lines on my part. As noted before, almost none of Typhoid Mary's past is just plain ever spelled out. There's honestly even a question mark whether Mary Walker is her birth name or not, or if it's just an identity that she assumed. Typhoid even says, when Quincy asks what she saw, she says that she saw things she never remembered before. So were those memories that she was seeing? Were they fiction? We might never know the truth. But the evidence matches up, and it explains a lot of the actions that we see Mary and her alters undertake, and it's really heartbreaking. All of this story is heartbreaking. Jack Terranova suspected that his wife was killing the women that he slept with, so he not only filmed one of the murders in hopes of proving that he didn't do it, he also didn't stop his wife from killing that woman. He literally let her get murdered and then he kept going into the city knowing that he was putting women's lives in danger. Mrs. Terranova's own motivations are kept fairly simple. When Quincy is first telling her about his movie asking why do killers kill, she actually answers him, saying lust and boredom. We are also shown her fantasizing about getting a facelift at one point. Quinty even tries to talk her out of it. I wonder if that is why she wears the headscarf and glasses all the time, to either maybe hide her age or her surgery scars. Mrs. T knows that her husband is cheating on her with younger women, and perhaps even worse, a variety of younger women. We're told that she killed an Asian woman, a blonde woman, a redhead, and a black woman. How can a single woman like Mrs. Terranova possibly compete against that variety? She just wants her husband to want her, and nothing she does will do the trick. I would argue uh, that there's probably also some level of like an OCD-like need to clean that is driving her as well. We're shown a handful of memories where she talks about cleaning dirty money that Quincy found on the ground, and when Typhoid accuses her of murder, Mrs. T says that she was actually cleaning up her husband's dirty mess. This might allude to the fact that Jack Terranova made his fortune with money acquired through his illegal acts as a police officer, and so all of the money in their house is dirty money. Even Mrs. T's motivations are sad and unfortunately motivated by the actions of a man, again, demonstrating that in this household, it is the men who have all the power. I suppose Mrs. T does win in a really sad kind of way. Jack's actions are known to dodge, at least. Then he says that he can't go into the city anymore. They're both done, he said, implying that he can't make his trips and she won't be able to kill anymore. So maybe in a way she got what she wanted. Her husband has to be faithful to her. Whether that means they'll actually, you know, have sex ever again, I don't know. And it's still kind of the worst possible way to reach that ending. Detective Dodge quits being a police officer, convinced that she can't do enough to combat the corruption inside her own department and still do good things. She does solve at least part of the crime. She figured that Jack Terranova was connected to the killings, at least, and when he contacted her to warn Richards, she did learn who the other killer was. But then Bloody does her thing, killing Richards, and Dodge lets it happen. 
because sometimes, in order to do the right thing, you have to work outside the book. He killed two of those women, and apparently the police will protect him, so she lets Bloody handle him. Richards taught her that lesson the hard way, and Dodge learned it well. I also like the scene because it echoes something that Typhoid said earlier to Quincy and Trent when they asked, why do you kill? And she went, don't you understand that some people just deserve to die? Richards is a pretty good case. So in a weird way, former Detective Dodge won her personal conflict, but she lost the moral high ground. The whole book is that way, and that's honestly one of my favorite things about this particular comic. There is no black and white morality in this superhero comic. No one is right. Everyone is wrong. The world is a terrible place that we are all simply doing our best to navigate. We're all victims, and we've all become monsters because of it. Typhoid doesn't even save any lives in this story when you think about it. She goes into the city in order to avenge Cynthia, who I believe was the woman killed by Officer Rosset, because that killing is then what inspired Mrs. T and Detective Richards as copycat killers. So Mary and her alters do succeed in that arena, I guess. They do, they do punish the man who killed Cynthia, uh, but everyone that they try to defend otherwise, like Tulip or Hester, still gets killed. I guess that Dodge knowing about Terra Nova maybe keeps him in check, and bloody killing Richards does help prevent any future killings he might have done, but still, this book doesn't end with this feeling like a win. Don't get me wrong, one of the things that I love the most about superhero comics is the black and white morality of it. That simple view of the world is incredibly appealing and comforting. But it is important to remember that that isn't how the actual world works. Bad people can do good things, and good people can do bad things. And occasionally it is nice to read one of these comics that doesn't just remind us of that fact, but embodies it so totally. I could not read a comic like this all the time. It is just way too grim and depressing for my personal tastes. But every once in a while, it is a nice change of pace and a reminder of the serious stories that comic books can tell. The superpowered parts of Mary's story honestly barely come into play here. I would argue that the story's handling of disassociative identity disorder is perhaps the biggest piece of fiction and the most unrealistic part about it. The rest of this story would feel right at home as an episode of CSI or SVU or just as part of a hard-boiled detective novel. I especially love the idea of Mary setting up shop as an actual private investigator, albeit one with a focus on helping women in need. And you know what? Let's face it, the best private eye stories all start with a woman walking into the detective's office anyways. It might as well be to someone who prioritizes their needs, right? It also feels like a cool thing for Mary to be doing when she is not involved, you know, in like Daredevil comics or Avengers the Initiative or Deadpool or whatever. Because let's face it, Typhoid Mary does not have a lot of appearances for a character that has existed for almost like 40 years. I think that she is simply so complicated, so strange, and so alien to most male comic book creators, and let's face it, most comic book writers are men, uh, that no one really knows what to do with the character. Like, even for myself, like, if you were to be like, Ben, pitch me a Typhoid Mary story, I don't know what that story would be. Nocenti setting Typhoid up as a private investigator gives the character an ongoing mission, a real purpose, and leaves her open for future use by other authors really nicely. Honestly, it's perfect. And the altars being invested in helping, or even having the potential to work against one another during an investigation adds a really unique complication that you're not going to get in a Daredevil comic or a Spider-Man comic or a, I don't know, Luke Cage comic, right? Jessica Jones comic. The only thing I don't like about the ending is that Mary, specifically the virginal Mary, is shown writing a new postcard to her boyfriend, John, back in suburbia. Given that John already had questions about Mary and her relationship to her roommate, Walker, uh, I don't know if he is down with this relationship or if he is done with it. 
It kind of feels like Mary is writing the postcards almost on autopilot here at the end. And I do like kind of the reveal when we were in the mind state that the virginal Mary identity doesn't like see blood. Like blood is a concept that is beyond her comprehension. It defaults to paint in her mind. It's part of what protects the virginal Mary from the more violent acts that typhoid or bloody do. So they do terrible things and kill somebody and she wakes up surrounded in a pool of blood. Virginal Mary doesn't goes, oh no, it's blood. She just goes, whoa, look at all this pain. I think that's a really cool and twisted character detail. We are told, quote, that she marked time with postcards, pictures of all the ticky tacky New York City sites that she never bothered to see, end quote, which sounds really dismissive. She sent the postcards in order to mark time, not necessarily to connect with her boyfriend. I complained that John's role in this story is almost non-existent, and that remains true right up to the end of it. Oh, uh, as a small note, uh, I made mention last episode that Mary sometimes has an eye shape around her head when she switches between altars. It is not a consistent thing throughout the comic, but it does happen in the first two issues. Well... When we're shown the door to Mary's office, a detailed human eye is painted on the door above her name. This could obviously allude to her being a private eye, but um, psh, but I think it might also be a reference to her altars. And if so, that's a pretty neat artistic detail. Before we leave this episode, I would like to note that I had just watched Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho film, like The Week before I first read Typhoid, and its story was built around a woman who was forced into prostitution, the horror of her life, and the ways in which she fought back against the men who abused her. It's honestly a fantastic movie. Uh, I love its presentation, and I think that the cast did a great job with it overall. I'm an absolute Edgar Wright fanboy at this point, uh, and despite the movie's slow start, Last Night in Soho really stuck with me. And I think the echoes of that story really took me into typhoid and then helped it make more of an impact. Those themes that were explored in Last Night in Soho just resonated so much with what was explored in typhoid and just made that much more of an impact with me. One of the things that I didn't even realize about this comic until I was editing the episodes, uh, Hello from the Future, uh, was how well it handles its touchy subjects. One of the core elements of typhoid's story is police corruption. And to some degree, the story doesn't even consider it police corruption. That's just how the world of policing works. At the beginning of the story, the first person that Bloody killed was the police officer who had slept with Rachel. Bloody also killed Officer Reset, who killed Cynthia at the start of the story. Detective Richards collects favors and gifts from citizens, showing them that he isn't a rigid by the book authoritarian. They trust in his self-interest more than they trust him to be a good person. As Dodge is finishing up her visit with the police psychologist, we see another officer calling a sex hotline so that he can relieve some stress. Again, an officer engaging in an activity that can be illegal, depending on circumstances and your local state laws. Jack Terranova was able to retire with enough dirty money that he could live quite comfortably because the police department, not a corrupt figurehead, not a powerful individual, but the entire department thought that he'd earned it. Even Dodge's mentor figure, Harry, advocates for letting police officers do the occasional bad thing, like sleeping with a prostitute, collecting favors, stealing money, or killing a few prostitutes even, because in the long run, they do more good deeds than they do bad, because of their policing of bad people. Even Detective Dodge, our hard line in the sand good guy character, ends up letting a man get murdered before her very eyes, because he was also a killer. I suppose she at least had the decency to turn in her badge and not pretend that she was a moral authority figure anymore, so, you know, good for Dodge. And yet, we never see any of these explicit acts on paper, on panel, in our hands. None of the killings that happen before our eyes happen at all. There's always a cutaway from the action, or there's a focus on the gun going off, or there's just a splatter of blood on a nearby wall. <laughs> When we see Reset's first scene, the prostitute Rachel tells him that he already got his favor, meaning that they already had sex. But again, we never got to see that happen. 
author Nocenti carefully has us show up immediately before or after any explicit actions happen. Sometimes we do have dialogue to indicate that such a thing happened, but we never get to see it on panel. And for a comic made during the extremes of the 1990s, I find that to be incredibly fascinating and subtle and really good storytelling. Similarly, given how much this book circles various sex topics, you would think that it might indulge in just a little wanton sexual exploitation. Again, this is the 90s. But no. While yes, we do see prostitutes in various stages of undress, they are never shown fully naked. And I would argue that they are never glamorized when they are shown. You go look at some of Jim Lee's drawings of Psylocke in 1990's X-Men, or Joe Mad's Red Monica in Battle Chasers, or, or pretty much any female character in Augustine and Ramos's Crimson from Cliffhanger. Those ladies were meant to be sexy, 100% of the time, all of the time. But here, the women aren't made to be sexy or beautiful. They are not made to sell to a male audience. They look like... Well, I mean, they look like women. Even when they're shown them in their underwear, they aren't made to look like supermodels with ridiculously over-the-top figures drawn over two-page spread that shows us everything that we could possibly be shown without having them be nude. I'm actually kind of amazed at how much more sexualized Typhoid Mary became after her original appearances and this miniseries. If you look at Mary's earliest costume, it actually plays down quite a bit of her figure. Yes, she does wear fishnet stockings, and I would argue from the waist down, she's got a pretty sexualized costume. But honestly, most comic book panels are framed around a person's talking head. You're normally looking at somebody who's saying something. So the vast majority of panels in a comic are going to be showing the chest and up. That's why I don't worry about showing y'all what I look like from the waist down, because who cares what I look like from the waist down? I'm talking, you look at my head. Taking that into account, Typhoid's original design has a very bulky jacket that hides her breasts and shoulders. She's got these huge, like, metal shoulder pads on. In this comic, she's often depicted wearing, like, football-style shoulder pads. I believe, that she's w I believe that's what she's wearing on the cover for issue one, actually. And again, those are meant to be protective and bulky. Her bloody altar actually wears knives and broken glass like armor, further demonstrating how she doesn't want people, and especially men, to get close to her. If you compare that with her next set of modern appearances, like the Alex Maleev redesign in 1998's Daredevil issue 46, which was then used in her Avengers the Initiative appearances, Marvel artists definitely upped the sexy ante, which I honestly think just misses the point of the character. Yes, Typhoid is meant to be the most openly sexual of Mary's personalities, and she's easily the most famous of them, but that just isn't what the character is. Typhoid doesn't need to walk around with her boobs out because she's got her telepathy to tweak arousal centers in the brain anyways. Even if you weren't attracted to her, she can literally make you attracted to her. As demonstrated in this comic, Mary, as a person, is meant to be all things in one, just splintered into individual psyches. She is the virgin, the whore, the killer, the detective. And I feel like more modern interpretations of the character have really focused hard on the whore part, while sacrificing those other aspects of who she's supposed to be. But to be fair, even more modern recent appearances have handled her with a little bit more respect. 2013's X-Men saw Typhoid Mary join the Sisterhood, a group of anti-X-Men baddie ladies, and she dressed fairly normally, actually. Like, she does have some sexy in that design, but it isn't the overriding design element anymore. She's become a little bit more, like, she's a normal lady, but she's wearing a little bit more provocative clothing. But again, it doesn't tip into the ridiculous, over-the-top stuff, like walking around with a leather jacket and bare boobs. Uh, the same for her appearances in 2019's recent Daredevil run by Chip Zdarsky. So, she has swung from a character design that was really inspired by how a woman would cope with sexual violence at an early stage of her life into just kind of a sex object in like the post-90s world, which is weird, 
Uh, and then she's kind of swung back again to a more nuanced interpretation. She's being treated more as an actual character and a person again in her more recent appearances. Uh, I know she's been over in the X-Men books a little bit thanks to her marriage to Wilson Fisk, a.k.a. the Kingpin of Crime, uh, but she hasn't really done much as of yet. We haven't really gotten to see her as a character. Um, I know she's one of the main cast members in Realm of X, uh, a five-issue miniseries that just started coming out, but it hasn't finished yet, and I haven't read all of it, so who knows how that's going to be. But finally, the book blatantly features a couple psychological issues as well, like Mary's DID or Trent's self-harming. Neither of these ideas are presented as faults for either of the characters. They aren't failings. They aren't things that are wrong with them. It's just a part of who they are. Look at Trent. Yes, he self-harms, but he is intelligent, he's compassionate, and he is charming, even if he isn't all of those things all of the time. Even when Mary is dismissive of his practice, joking that he has a roadmap on his arms, she doesn't hate him for it, or dislike him for it, or judge him for that action. It is treated as something he has to deal with, absolutely, but it isn't his personal fault or a personal failing. It's another thing to overcome. And this is the one case where maybe the creative team failed their ability to keep things subtle a little bit. There is a scene in issue two, right before Trent meets Mary's boyfriend, John, when we're shown him thinking on the connection between him and Mary. We actually see his rolled up sleeves, the scars on his arms, and it sure looks to me like blood on his fingers. I interpret this to mean that he has been harming in the meantime while he's waiting. However, this series also presents uh, red paint as a bit of a metaphor for cutting, stabbing, or bleeding things, as seen with the Mary altar being a painter, while none of the rest of her altars are artists at all. Maybe, while waiting for John to come home, Trent was playing with the red paint, putting it on his arms as if he was cutting. This is one of those times when Van Fleet's artwork makes it pretty hard to read what was actually going on here. And honestly, if that is what happens, that he was just putting paint on his arms to simulate the cuts that he would be making if he was engaging in self-harm, I think that's actually kind of clever and an interesting way to show how much this is a part of him, but still without doing any actual harm to himself. But Van Fleet's artwork just makes it so hard to read, I, I can't say one way or the other how it goes. But as for Mary, she is never presented as feeble, weak, or like she is broken, thanks to her disassociative identity disorder. Again, it is another challenge for her that she has to deal with, absolutely, but her alters have a system for communicating with each other, they seem to trust one another for the most part, even if they don't always get along, and Mary does, at the end of the day, solve the mystery and save the day as much as she can. Are her DID elements played up for the story? Absolutely. This is a comic book after all, and it's a superhero comic book. Some fictionalizing of real world things is bound to happen. But I do feel that Nocenti does a really good job balancing the alters, their relationships to one another, and their relationship to the world, and what they mean to each other and how they influence the story incredibly well. I would like to say... Uh, dear listener, that if you do self-harm or if you have had or sometimes struggle with suicidal thoughts, it's absolutely okay to ask for help. You can text CONNECT to 741741 for help with self-harm, and 988 is the Suicide Prevention Hotline. We all have problems of varying degrees, and everybody handles them in different ways. And sometimes those problems seem absolutely insurmountable, and there's just no solution in sight. I assure you that there are solutions to those problems. They're not always going to be easy, but there are solutions. Sometimes we just need to ask for help, and not all of us are very good at doing that, myself included. But you can, and you shouldn't feel shame for that. Overall, this miniseries was way more interesting than I ever expected it to be. I do think that this comic fails as an introduction to who Typhoid Mary is and what her entire deal is. A lot of the information that I did learn about her, I had to look up on outside sources, and I would call that a little bit of bad writing. Maybe if you already had a passing familiarity with the character, like if I had already read 
I don't know, 20 years worth of Daredevil comics, then maybe this story would have worked better. As a relative newbie to the character, I don't think that the story did enough to educate me. That said, this comic did entertain the crap out of me. I found the mystery incredibly engaging. Mary is a compelling, complex character. Uh, I love how every facet of the story explored the themes of power and morality and guilt. Ultimately, no one in this comic was without sin, but some people choose to do more good than bad. Typhoid ultimately presents a more nuanced look at the Marvel Universe than we traditionally get, and I did end up loving it for it. Next time, though, something completely different. One of Marvel's most famous witches, Agatha Harkness, tries to relieve some of the burden that her student, the Scarlet Witch, carries within her. Doing so pits Marvel Universe hero against Marvel Universe hero. But to what end? Join me in a week for my thoughts on the Contest of Chaos. If you enjoyed this episode of Breakdown, please make sure to hit that like button. And if you are not subscribed to the show, then click on that as well. I love getting feedback and I would really appreciate it if you did so. If you have any questions, concerns, or would like to suggest a comic or a series to me, Breakdown can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and on a variety of podcast platforms with links in the description for this episode below, as well as the email cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Thank you for your time and attention.